never get tired of hearing it. Indiana has an official state rifle. Did you know we've got an official state rifle? I'll never get tired of hearing those words. And did you know that that rifle resides right here in Vincennes in the former home of William Henry Harrison? Wow, I'll never get tired of it. Um, this is uh, uh, really a dream come true. I'd like to spend the evening uh, talking about uh, really three things. First of all, how did this state rifle come to be? Then I'd like to shift gears and talk a little, little bit about John Small himself. Who was this man that made this beautiful rifle over here? Then I'd like to say a few words about the Kentucky rifle. What is a Kentucky rifle? What makes it so different? Why do people, collectors, get so excited about this style of rifle? So, for me, it started back in the 1980s. Uh, Jim Dressler was a good friend of mine. And uh, when I came back from that North Carolina trip, I searched out people who could help me in the quest of, of finding information on Indiana gun makers. Jim Dressler was one of the first people that I met. Jim had a huge collection of Western Frontier artifacts, everything from Kentucky rifles to mountain rifles to engraved powder horns, Bowie knives. It was a fabulous collection, and he shared it with the public. His first John Small items were purchased in the 1980s. The, the first specimen was a tomahawk uh, made by John Small. Uh, then he purchased a powder horn. 1989, he purchased his first John Small rifle. That rifle was built right here in Vincennes, and it was built for Vincennes' favorite son, Francis Vigo. Jim Dressler elevated the reputation of John Small and heightened his awareness of, amongst the America, amongst the public and collectors alike. When he, every time that he brought home a John Small specimen, Jim Dressler heightened that awareness. About the same time, uh, the 1980s, a man named Richard Day, he needs no introduction here in Vincennes, but a man named uh, Richard Day was researching for a book called The Pictorial History of Vincennes. That book was uh, published in 1988, but Richard placed in his book a photograph of a very, very fine John Small rifle. And when Richard put that photograph in his book, he also heightened the awareness of John Small. It's both collectors and to the public alike. Then, to my knowledge, Grossland, this is when I'm, I'm, I'm starting to learn about the Grossland Foundation now. The Grossland Foundation purchased a fine rifle made that was made by John Small out in North Carolina, brought it back home to Vincennes, and put it in a permanent exhibit in the former home of William Henry Harrison. And the Grossland Foundation heightened the awareness of John Small to the public and to collectors alike. The Indiana State Museum got involved. This is, this is now somewhere in the neighborhood of 2005. Uh, but the uh, State Museum got involved uh, when Jim Dressler went to them uh, looking for a buyer for his John Small collection. Jim's health was not good. Jim suffered from Parkinson's disease. Jim wanted to make sure that his uh, collection was placed in appropriate uh, spots so that the public could uh, appreciate it. And uh, a man by the name of Dale Ogden got involved in the museum, and Dale Ogden recognized the historic value of these uh, items and uh, recognized the, the, the artistic value of John Small's work, and, and, and the state uh, purchased Jim Dressler's um, a collection of John Small items. About that time period, uh, my friend uh, Shelby Galeen, friend and collector Shelby Galeen, um, got involved uh, with John Small and, and was also fascinated, as I was, with John Small and wrote a fantastic magazine article on uh, John Small and his rifles. Uh, that article was published in, in, in two, um, uh, 
two monthly magazines in gun report back, I believe it was in 2004, 2005. About that same year, uh, June Dressler came to me and, and said, Jeff, uh, and, and, and keep in mind his uh, health is, is failing at this time. He said, Jeff, I need some help. Uh, this, this man named John Small needs to be recorded. His, we need to record the photographs and we need to record the story of this man and we need to uh, write a book on John Small. Will you help me? And uh, that's how, that's when I got involved uh, with the book on John Small. Uh, when Jim gave me my marching orders back then in 2005, uh, the first thing that I did, of course, is uh, go to a man named Richard Day. And uh, Richard Day knows um, uh, more about John Small than anybody. He knows more about Vincennes uh, than anybody. And, and Richard Day uh, generously shared his knowledge. Uh, if, if he didn't know the answers of the questions that I asked him, he knew where to find the answers. And if it wasn't for uh, Richard Day, the, the book never would have happened. Um, I learned about the man named Palmer this evening. I didn't know about the, the man named Palmer, Palmer and his involvement um, with the state rifle. Uh, what I learned about was uh, State Senator Waterman's involvement in that. Uh, Senator Waterman uh, actually wrote the uh, legislation that designated this rifle as an official state rifle. And that happened in, uh, I believe it was 2012, like, uh, about a year ago. So that's the story, as I know it, of how this uh, rifle came to be, or not, how this rifle came to be the state rifle. some characteristics different than uh, what you see on this gun, but uh, they were bringing these rifles over here, and the, the American frontiersmen thought that, you know, we, we could make these better. Can you, can you give me a gun that, that maybe is a little bit more accurate? So what they did is they, they uh, lengthened the barrels on them so that the distance from the rear sight to the front sight was a little bit longer, and, and, and by theory, that would give them a little bit more accuracy when they aim. So the barrels started to get longer. They went from about 25 to 30 inches long in the Jaeger to about 40 to 48 inches long on the American long rifle or the Kentucky rifle. Then the, uh, the frontiersman said, boy, these, these, these big bullets, these big black balls that, that I gotta carry around for the Jaeger rifle, they're pretty heavy. I, now, can, is there a way, Mr. Gunsmith, that you can lighten my load? And uh, the caliber size got reduced from 60 to 70. What, you know, 60 or 70 uh, uh, caliber bullet is a big ball. It's a big lead ball. And, and that's what they were shooting out of the Jaeger rifles. But the frontiersman didn't need that size of ball. He, he wanted something smaller, a 45 caliber ball would kill a white-tailed deer very efficiently. And 
so they, they reduce the size of the caliber from 60 or 70 down to about 45 caliber, sometimes 50 caliber. And you know what, the frontiersman, he'd have to carry maybe a pound and a half or, 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 or two pounds less of lead around with him when he went hunting all day, and that was a big deal, if you could lighten your load that much. Then, uh, the frontiersman said, you know what, I'm, I'm sick and tired of these, these wooden uh, lids that, 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 that you guys are putting over your patch boxes. The, the Jaeger rifle had a sliding wood patch box that covered the, uh, uh, the orifice in the butt, in the butt of the rifle. And every time he went out hunting, he'd bump that lid and it would get lost in the woods. Well, he got sick and tired of going back to the gunsmith to get another one made. So, what the, and again, this is strictly American. This was happening for the first time in the firearms industry. They, the, the gunsmiths started to put a brass patch box on the butt of the gun. And that, that, that brass patch box was hinged. So there was no way anybody was ever going to lose one of those brass patch boxes. Okay, so you got, you got a few things. You got the, the, the rifle starting to develop. It's getting longer. The, the caliber's getting smaller. And, and you got this brass patch box on the, on the butt of the gun. All great improvements for uh, America here. Uh, then, what happened is we, we, we finished the, uh, the wars, the, the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War, and soldiers came home. And you know what they brought with them when they came home? They, they brought their military arms with them. And that's what they used to hunt. So the gunsmiths were now competing with all these arms coming back from and they thought, you know, what can we do now to sell our guns uh, to, to this market that's flooded with military guns? And the, the answer was is they started to produce art on their guns. And uh, back in that time was the age of Rococo, uh, Rococo art that, that, that came from France. And um, France was a friend of America. American gunsmiths uh, took their art and started to put it on the butt stocks of the guns. And that was starting to help sell their guns. Um, the art was fabulous. Uh, it was uh, uh, Rococo C scrolls and Rococo S scrolls on the butt side of the gun and, and on the forearm. And then they engraved the, uh, the brass parts with the Rococo C scrolls. And, and the gun really became a beautiful piece of art. So, that is a Kentucky rifle. Uh, the, the, the rifle also started to get architecture. That uh, instead of a plain, uh, 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 well, I don't know if I would call it clunky, but the art started to get graceful. Uh, the, the gun started to get graceful. It started to take shape. And, and gun makers were using something called the golden mean. It, it was a way of using proportion in everything that they did. So uh, the guns started to get more and more graceful after the war. And uh, uh, it, it became a thing of beauty that people wanted to buy and people wanted to show off. That became the Golden Age Kentucky Rifle. I gotta get my right uh, advancer here. Um, before we go to John Small, I should I should finish up there a little bit with the, the Kentucky rifle because you know these gun makers were the most talented craftsmen in the world at the time, and 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 I say that because I would challenge anybody to come up with another craft that required. Uh, the craftsmen to work in so many mediums. The gun maker was an expert in iron. He hand forged that barrel by hand. It took two men two days to make a gun barrel. He started with a bar of iron and ended up with a, a, an iron tube that would shoot a, a lead ball uh, 200 yards accurately. That took some skill. And they had no electricity. They did that all by hand. 
Then the gun maker had to be an expert woodworker. He started out with a hard chunk of, of tiger maple, and he had to cut a barrel channel 45 inches long in that hard curly maple. That took some skill. When he was done with that barrel channel, then he had to put the, uh, the mortise in the, the side of the stock for the lock plate to fit. And he had to do it perfectly. It had to be put in there with precision or that gun wasn't gonna fire. When he was done with the lock plate, the third piece that had to fit with precision were the triggers. The triggers that he had made from iron. And he placed them in there with superb precision and they didn't have lasers. They didn't have computer aided design. They did this all by hand. That gun maker had to be an expert in brass. Uh, that, uh, that butt plate was cast in brass and then it was filed and sometimes it was engraved with sea scrolls, with cocoa sea scrolls. That patch box, beautifully designed and inlet into the wood. Every little curve and every little piercing on that brass patch box that you see up here is cut out of the wood and that brass plate is laid into the wood and it fits perfectly. There's no slop in these guns. They were beautiful, they were a precision instrument and they were artistic and that was the golden age of American rifle building. John Small lived through that golden age. He came here to Vincennes about the beginning of the golden age, about 1785, and the golden age ended about when he died, about 1820. John Small died 1821. Generally speaking, the golden age ends about 1820. That's a little bit more about these gun makers, and, and, and you know what? I'm, I'm, I think we all should be proud that Indiana has a rifle made by such a talented man uh, with a style that's all American. It was the right rifle for Indiana. So who is this John Small guy anyway? I'll talk a little bit about uh, the early years. He was born in uh, Northern Ireland, a town called Londonderry. He was Scotch-Irish, and uh, he came, he emigrated to America uh, I think it was, uh, he was born seven, uh, 1759 and he emigrated here 1768. In 1773, we find him at Fort Pitt and he's in the journal books of a master gun maker there named Butler. And, and we surmise from that, that that Butler is his master. And we can look at, we, we know of some of Butler's work still exists and we can look at Butler's work and we can look at John Small's work and and you can see, you can see a, a, a very strong resemblance. So from that we can presume that Butler was John Small's master. So he was trained at Fort Pitt. After the, uh, when he was uh, at Fort Pitt, he volunteered uh, in the military for a guy named General Hand. So that's where he had his military experience. He had militia experience there in Pennsylvania. Shortly after the Revolutionary War ended, 1785, John Small comes out to Vincennes. He had earned a 300 acre land grant right here, and this is where he spent the rest of his life. When we talk about his pioneering experience, it's easier to talk about who he wasn't rather than who he was and what, what he did or what he didn't do. It's, John Small did it all. In my mind, uh, uh, to coin a phrase, he's an action hero. And he did whatever, it, whatever the, uh, uh, the, the moment required. Uh, if we, we, can do, we can talk about a list of things that he did for a living, but, but it will only be a partial list. He was a gunsmith, he was a silversmith, he was a carpenter, he was a blacksmith, uh, he was a politician, he was a soldier. Um, he was a businessman putting up the tavern here in Vincennes, and he ran the uh, ferry across the Wabash here in Vincennes. John Small was an action hero in my mind. Um, in researching the, uh, some of the archives,
Sykes, I'm John Small. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, time periods was, was when he came here in 1786 and he was uh, uh, appointed leader of the militia. And it wasn't long after that, only about a year uh, after he was appointed. The time period would have been, I think, 17, uh, 1786, that some of the Native Americans uh, were kind of naughty, and uh, John Small uh, went out to spank them. And that was called the episode on the Embra, or the, uh, the skirmish on the Embra. There are two differing accounts of how that skirmish actually ended. One account says that John Small was a big uh, uh, hero. The other account says that John Small lost that skirmish, that the Indians were victors. Uh, we know that he was uh, wounded in that skirmish. But if you want to read both accounts, i got a great book that I'll tell you about. <laughs> There's another guy named William Hurst in John Small's life. And uh, William Hurst was William Henry Harrison's right-hand man uh, at, at the time, or his secretary. And uh, William Hurst uh, came out to the Wabash River one day, and John Small was there with some of his buddies. And William Hurst made a, a condescending comment in front of uh, John Small's buddies. And John Small took it personally and looked at it as a challenge to his honor. John Small turned around and challenged William Hurst to a duel, like a lot of men did back in those days, if your honor is, is challenged. Uh, an interesting story in the book is about that uh, dueling challenge. Uh, the story goes that uh, there was messengers going back and forth from John Small to William Hurst after this uh, dueling challenge, and that William Hurst accepted the challenge. And the day of the uh, the day of the duel that was to happen on the west bank of the Wabash, uh, John Sh John Small showed up, but William Hurst did not. And later, he uh, Hurst was quoted as saying, "You think I'd fight with a man who did nothing but make rifles and shoot them?" <laughs> uh, probably a pretty smart man, and probably the reason uh, he was uh, William Henry Harrison's right-hand man. <laughs> John Small made, uh, made arms for very important people. Uh, people that made arms for important people uh, did important work. They did the best work. Uh, he, he made uh, uh, either tomahawks or, or firearms for guys like Henry Knox, Pierre Menard, Francis Beagle, Lewis, one of the Clarks, and one of the Gurdies, and the list goes on. But there are six known firearms, six known firearms, uh, and uh, a lot of those are for, were made for very important people. Now, I think my time is waning, so I'm going to uh, uh, end this uh, show with some pictures. Um, this is a, a, a pistol out of uh, Jim Dressler's collection. It was made for uh, Pierre Menard, who worked here in Vincennes as a fur trader. He worked for Francis Vigo. And uh, he also went to uh, Illinois and became lieutenant governor of the state of Illinois. It's a beautiful pistol. It shows uh, great relief carving here on the forestock, and a great, it shows great silver work here in the buttstock of the gun as well. Uh, this is the same gun, uh, different angles. You, you see there on the left, John Small's signature on the gun. On the right, you see John Small's trademark inlay. Every known firearm that exists of John Small has this shape of inlay in it. I call it the double fleur de lis. And uh, in the center of that uh, inlay, you see the initials PM, Pierre Menard. There's
here's the, uh, the buttstock of uh, Francis Beagle's rifle. I'm going to try to zoom in on this um, and show you guys some details of that rifle. Now, up here, you can see, you can see where that stock was inlet for the patch box. You can see the skill and the patience it took to cut that wood out and lay that silver into that wood. Looking at this picture, you can see the different mediums a gunsmith had to work with. You see the wooden stock, you see the silver patch box, you see the brass uh, butt plate. In the center here is a gold plate that has the, uh, the name Colonel Francis Vigo uh, written in it. There's a full length view of that rifle. This is the Gertie rifle, also in, in Dressor's collection. Um, the patch box here is called a Lancaster style patch box. It was common, commonly used in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. This rifle is unsigned. The only uh, known small firearm that is unsigned, and, and, and we believe that it's unsigned because Small made it at Fort Pitt when he was still an apprentice. He was not yet a master gunsmith. And it's got the Lancaster box on it because remember who we learned this trade from? A guy named Butler, who was working in Lancaster and then went to Fort Pitt. So it's it's definitely John Small's hand, but it's unsigned. There's a, a I'm going to zoom in on this one only because I want to show you that uh, right here on the lock plate is a name. John Small did not always make his own locks. Uh, he sometimes purchased locks by a lock maker, somebody who specialized in making those locks. So he did not always um, make uh, his, his own locks. Uh, there's a close-up of that patch box. It's, I think it's gorgeous and a full-length view of that same rifle. This is uh, Dressler's uh, first powder horn uh, that he bought. Um, th this is, of course, a, uh, a horn that came from a buffalo. But it's very unique in that it's got a silver spout. It's got silver bands here with rings on it to, uh, to, hold, it, to hold the shoulder strap. And it's got a silver plug up here on, on top. There's, there's very few people who had the skill to work with silver uh, like this on the frontier. And this is not signed by John Small. But if you look at that butt plug, look at that engraving. There we see the initials engraved in that, that plug, DC. And, and, and this is, without a doubt, John Small's hand. Know that um, John Small made this horn. And uh, there's uh, Jim's tomahawk. I wanted to show this one because John Small's Indian name was Big Knife. Indians called him Big Knife. And uh, lo and behold, here's a uh, Here's one of John Small's signature silver inlays. It's a big knife laid into the, uh, the, the iron of that uh, tomahawk plate. Okay, now let's get to the best ones. <laughs> Here comes the state rifle pretty soon. But first, uh, Richard Dave uh, published this picture in his book, that took, uh, history of Vincennes, and, and uh, this, is, this is about the time period, uh, uh, right before the time period, I started getting interested in, in the long rifle, but this is a fine, fine uh, piece of work that recently got sold at auction about a year ago, but um, I'm going to show you an inlay on the butt side of this gun. 
that's inlaid in silver and engraved by John Small. And, and in Masonic uh, history, the Masons used this symbol, the urn, as a place to put your heart. The urn was a place to put your heart. And John Small put the urn on this rifle. And to me, it speaks, it says, I put my heart into this work. And it's arguably, well, at auction, this rifle broke a record. Highest price paid at public auction for a long rifle. How much? Uh, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> it, uh, it, it was well over 100000 for this one. Now, I, just to clarify, it wasn't the highest price ever paid for a long rifle, but at the time it was the highest price paid at public auction for a rifle. That's, I just want to clarify that. Again, this is the same rifle. I'm more, I, I showed this picture for a couple of reasons. I, um, the signature in this photograph really stands out. and uh, you, you can see John Small's uh, precision and you can see his artistic talent in this signature. You know, if I practice all my life, I could not write a signature with a lead pencil like that. It's, but but he, he engraved it into silver. Also wanted to show this. This is, the, this is a, a photograph from underneath the gun, the toe plate. And I'm going to show you a photograph of the state gun also. The toe plate on the state gun, and you will see the, uh, the, the, the resemblance there. I'm going to get to it because I know my time is winding down. Um, here we are, uh, the state rifle of Indiana, and uh, a close-up of the patch box. Um, this rifle has, oops, this rifle has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine column piercings. Nine times that uh, brass was pierced, and nine times John Small had to fit the wood around that piece of brass when he laid it. Uh, beautiful uh, engraving. There's the angel Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel uh, was the messenger of God. Gabriel was the strength of God. And, and, and thus, Gabriel was put on uh, uh, the patch box lid of this, this rifle. On the flip side, there's a, uh, a close-up silver, uh, magnificent silver inlay on the buttstock of the state rifle, and, and uh, John Small engraved, uh, there's over 200 feathers in this eagle that he put in painstakingly one at a time. Uh, it's got a beautiful shield and, and arrows in, in one claw and an olive branch in the other over here, and then down below is the, uh, the military the scene. With, uh, you see two cannons down here. You see the military drum, you see the cannonballs, the flags, the pike, the sword, you see the bugle, and another flag. Um, truly, this gun was uh, used or made for a military man, in my mind, anyway. There's that toe plate. Um, John Small, like many gun makers, used his, the features over and over and over again. And uh, there it is again. That toe plate, I, I've never seen another one like it on another gun. And there's a, uh, a beautiful full-length shot of the state rifle uh, showing the architecture and, and gracefulness of, uh, that John Small put into his work. The signature on the state rifle. This is the underside of the stock right here. And there's a brass wear plate on the underside. And uh, if you look closely, you can see the, the Rococo engraving that, that I alluded to a little bit earlier on that state rifle. It's gorgeous. And this is the top of the cone. Or if you, if you look at the butt of that gun and you look straight down on, on top of that, rifle butt, you can see beautiful wire inlay in the Rococo design here. Very fine, very, very fine silver wire inlay. A silver diamond. And 
that wire inlay continues along both sides of that diamond and terminates up here on the comb of that rifle. But certainly, uh, John Small also put his heart into this gun. And uh, lastly is, is the Clark rifle. I want to show you uh, uh, the Clark rifle. This, this rifle was passed down to the Clark family. It resides in the museum in St. Louis. But there again, John Small used the Angel Gabriel as a design on his path. There's the signature again, and a large silver inlay on the butt stop. <laughs> if you want to know more, <laughs> there's a good book. Do you have it here for sale? It'll be for sale. Uh, yes, please. Uh, right here is my favorite salesperson, my wife, Deb. She'll, uh, she'll meet you up front, and uh, she'll be glad uh, uh, to do that. Yes. Any questions? I think my time is up. Uh, but go ahead. Where are you from? Were, were these guns, or were these, are these guns, were they like ceremonial guns? You know, were they lab H, or were they actually used out in uh, battle? They, no, they were used. They, uh, they were used, absolutely. I, I won't say that they were used in battle, but they would have been used for hunting, absolutely, yes. I said, where were you from? Where are you from? Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, and uh, uh, my, my career took me here to Indiana, where I met my wife, and now I reside oh, no, in Indiana. Indiana's Fishers. a big state. Where? Fishers, Indiana. Oh, Fishers, okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, um, I'm sorry. I think the first was up in the, the back. Well, there's a uh, there's a, a brass ring around the top of that haft, and that brass ring holds that blade onto the wooden haft. So um, it, it, it's put it, that that brass piece is put in there with brass, and it holds that that haft that uh, that blade on on top of that wooden piece. I think he's asking about the pipe part of it. Uh, pipe tomahawk. Hey, oh, are you talking about this piece right here? Oh, I thought you were talking about this piece. I'm sorry. No, this this is a, a pipe tomahawk, and they smoked. This is a this is a pipe bowl, okay? And 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 this would have been hollowed out down through the end. It's a like like a peace pipe, you know. They would they would smoke. Um, they would smoke out of that, or could smoke out of it. Yes. Were the weapons made out of the same type of wood? Uh, the Kentucky Long Rifle that was made in Pennsylvania, the predominant wood was tiger maple. Yes, no, no. always, no. The, they did use walnut, they did use cherry, they could use other woods, and, and sometimes they did, but uh, just to give you a rough guesstimate, maybe 90% of them were made out of curly maple uh, back in this time period. That's that's my own personal guesstimate. I have I have nothing to uh, uh, substantiate that other than looking at uh, guns and gun shows and so on. Do we know um, our, our state rifle uh, the the size of the Jim, do you want to answer that? Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Don't oh, okay. I'll stay here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more questions.
I would not shoot this gun. Um, <laughs> um, you're not there's there's no way. Um, it's, well, uh, uh, first of all, the gun's much too valuable to put gunpowder down and cause an explosion. One thing. Um, second thing is, uh, it, it should, a gunsmith should take a close look at the breech of that barrel to see if everything is still intact because over time, sometimes it corroded on the inside of that barrel and weakened it and that gun could explode if a charge were fired out of it. Okay. Any, any more? Yes, sir. You bet. Um, the, uh, the frontiersmen would carry with them a, uh, a powder measure, and, and, and that, that's a whole collecting world in and of itself, uh, because they were often made out of the tips of horns, uh, and, and, and oftentimes they were three or four inches long, and, and during this golden age, they would decorate those too with carving. And, and they knew how much powder they needed and they would make the uh, measure accordingly so that they could dump powder out of the horn into the measure and then into the muzzle of the barrel. Oh, well, I, on TV and the movies, well, okay, and, and, and you can do that if you're in a hurry, if you're in a battle or if you're trying to reload for a second shot at a deer, you don't have to measure, you can guesstimate. Absolutely. Yes. yes, sir. Is that a smooth bore barrel or is it rifling in it? Is this a smooth bore? No. This is not a smooth bore. There's rifling in this gun. In, in, in the Kentucky rifle, they, they spent much, uh, much time and effort getting the rifling correct uh, and, and so that, that gun would be very accurate. Yes, and this, this gun is definitely rifled. Thank you again for the opportunity.